I want to start, um, as it would be appropriate, uh, with Pentecost, but then go off in kind of a, a bit of a different direction. Um, the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. For anyone who has bought a house or a unit or whatever within uh, the Australian legal system, it's a three-part process. You normally sign the contracts. Um, the contracts are often subject to finance or maybe one or two other conditions, and the contract uh, usually a fortnight, give or take, later uh, goes unconditional, and then about a fortnight or so after that it settles. But when the contract is signed, um, you've normally, it varies from state to state, but you've normally got a cooling off period of eight or ten days. During that time you can say, oh look, I don't want to proceed, that's it. Once it goes unconditional, you can get out of it, but uh, it's a bit more complicated and you would inevitably have to pay uh, fees and penalties and so on. However, once it settles, that's it. Once it settles, you are now fully, totally responsible for the property. There is no argument, there is no refuting, there is, it, it's over, it's done, it's yours. Might I subject, sub, uh, submit to you a similar process up until Pentecost? Jesus said, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Now, whether you use the term covenant or testament, it's pretty much uh, uh, one and the same word. I'm not too sure why they use testament in the Gospels and covenant in the book of Hebrews, because it's the same word. The crucifixion was signing the contract. The resurrection was unconditional. And Pentecost was settlement. That's it. The covenant is ratified and sealed. There are nine covenants in scripture. Um, each covenant has its own seal. For instance, the Mosaic covenant, the seal of the covenant is the Sabbath. Uh, the um, Noahic covenant, the seal is the rainbow. The Abrahamic covenant, the seal uh, is circumcision. The new covenant, the seal, is the Holy Spirit. So it's not only a matter of God's word and his promises, and I mean, God is not a man that he should lie, but when we, we look at scriptures like uh, 2 Peter 1 verse 3 and 4, by his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is part of a New Testament uh, or a New Covenant, New Testament uh, promise, and that promise is has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It has that statement and, and, and his, all the promises and provisions of the New Testament have his eternal seal stamped on it. It's not just his word as if that wasn't enough. He's not a man that he should lie. But from Pentecost, the eternal seal of God is stamped upon his word. It is irrefutable. It cannot be disputed. It cannot be taken away. It is done, dusted, sealed, and it's part of his eternal covenant. Yes. So when some stinking devil comes along and wants to dispute some promise or some, hey, devil, chew on this for a while. It is not only a promise, but it has the eternal seal of God on it. Do you still want to argue about that? I think not. So the church, I, I, I want to, as I said, touch on, on Pentecost, but then go in a different direction. The church was birthed at Pentecost, and here we are a couple of thousand years later. It's gone through various stages of history in the Dark Ages and uh, you know, the whole historical process. And here we are a couple of thousand years later, and when I talk about the church, I'm not necessarily uh, directing this at any particular church or ministry or whatever, because I tend to uh, speak of the church more in the global or generic sense than any specific church. But here we are a couple of thousand years later, and with a few exceptions, I mean, there are a few out there, but not a heck of a lot in my experience, the church is not viewed in a particularly positive light by the world in general, 
Um, there's not too much evidence of power and signs and wonders in the church. Uh, it's generally a, a, a gathering of people on a Sunday morning or maybe a midweek home group uh, that sort of gathers together, listens to a message, learns something, praises, worships, and I mean all of those are good things. But you know, it's not really making a massive impact on society. Um, and it's generally by society as a whole not viewed in a particularly positive way. So what happened? What, what needs to be changed and where do we start with that? And that's really what I want to talk about this afternoon. And, and as we get into it, there's always layers. So it, it speaks to the church as a whole but it can then speak to an individual church or ministry and then it can also speak to the individual person. There's always layers when you start pulling apart the Word of God. For instance, the woman with the issue of blood. It's a historical story. It's a real woman with an issue of blood that spoke to a real Jesus. It's a historical account of what happened. But then you can also look at it as a faith to the individual today in the church. It speaks about a persevering faith. But then you look at it prophetically to the church and it actually speaks about restoration in the church because the woman in the New Testament is very often a type and a shadow of the church itself. So in other words, it can be historical, it can speak to the individual, but can church speak to the church as a whole. When you look at those that were following Jesus, there was a, a great crowd, there was the disciples, and then there was the one woman. So once again, it's talking about a crowd, the believers in general, it's talking about the disciples, the leaders, or it's talking about an individual. So in other words, there's always layers to it. When we get into this this afternoon, although it's largely directed generically at the church, but it's also about the individual. Because I know from experience there are often individuals sitting in churches that once had dreams, hopes, aspirations, goals, and so on, but it kind of feels like their dreams and hopes and aspirations have turned into Lazarus. You know, well, there, there was a day that I had great expectations and hopes and dreams and thought I was going to do this, that, whatever the case may be. But let me say to you this afternoon, resurrection life is still available to every hope, dream and aspiration you ever had. It is never too late. I mean, if ever you thought something was too late, consider Jesus and the thief on the cross. It's never too late. It's five minutes to midnight. It's still not too late. So the resurrection power of heaven and the eternal seal of the covenant is still available to whatever hope, dream and aspiration that you may have had that you thought somehow was lost. So I want to speak into the church, but also... In what I present, understand that it's for not just for the church as a whole, but it's also speaking to the individual dreams, hopes and aspirations of, of the individual person. And ultimately, when God does a work of restoration, there, there is an ultimate purpose in it. Yeah. Now, sometimes what happens, and I, I, I've made this mistake myself plenty of times, believe me. Anything I'm talking about up here is usually because I've learned it from, from the mistakes that I've made from bitter experience. Sometimes we can get so involved in the process that we lose sight of the ultimate purpose. Let me give you an example just from, from personal experience. Between 1999 and about 2011, uh, I was involved in a lot of international ministry, usually a couple of times, sometimes three times a year to India, Pakistan, Brazil, Africa, all over the place. I look back as we all sort of have the, the 2020 vision of hindsight, and I look back and, you know, I got very involved in the preparation to go. Now, that can be mundane things like the medications and the injections and the yellow fever for South America, Africa, whatever. It is. So it can be the mundanities. Then it can be prayer, fasting, whatever the case may be, preparing messages and so on. Then it can be getting on the plane and turning up in where it, wherever it is you're going, getting involved in the leadership there and the meetings and so on. And sometimes you get, come home on the plane and like a month later you're sort of sitting and thinking, yeah, but what was that all about? What was the ultimate purpose? 
I get so involved in the process, I missed the ultimate purpose. And there's a city, and it sort of, like this one occasion really sort of, I guess, hit me. There's a city in Brazil of about 600,000 people. We had a dynamic meeting there, and I was focused on the process. It was just part of the process. That, that meeting was that night, and there was another meeting the next night and for the next three weeks and so on. And I was caught up in the process. But it so happened that about a week after that particularly dynamic meeting that the power and the Spirit of God turned up in, we were driving back through that city on the way to somewhere else. And as we drove into the outskirts of the city and through the city itself, the entire atmosphere had changed. So the, I, I was so caught up in the process, I forgot the purpose, missed the purpose. So this afternoon, it's, it's about a process but understanding that the process is ultimately about revival globally. It's ultimately, and, and there is a process that I believe needs to be followed because sometimes we can also get to go the other way and get caught up in the, the vision but lose what we need to do to actually breathe life into it. The pastoral church has tended to, over the uh, centuries, become fairly passive. Most churches, and I say this with all due respect to pastors and churches, but most churches are fairly passive. Not doing a heck of a lot. I mean, the sheep are being fed, looked after their well-being and so on, and all of that's part of a good pastoral ministry. But, but the church is designed, called and purposed to have impact in the nation and, 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 and globally. And sometimes people look at churches small church, big church, whatever the case may be, it's not about numbers. Truly, it's not about numbers. It's about impact. And if you look at Gideon as probably the best example that I can think of, and imagine there there's a pastor of a mega church, he's got 32,000 people, he's pumping, he's happy, he's like pretty impressed with his whole ministry. Comes back uh, next Sunday and 22,000 have left. <laughs> Say what now? Well, 10,000 still sort of a mega church. I mean, we're still pumping and doing fairly well. Uh, comes back the following week and he's got 300. Monday morning, you probably visit him in ICU. Um, you, you know, on average. But the reality of it is, what if God wanted to change the course of history in the nation with the 300, not the 32,000? So it's not about numbers. Don't get to, I mean, numbers are nice. But it's not the real issue. The real issue is whatever numbers there are, whether it's 20 or 100 or 1,000, what impact are they having? It's about the impact. You know, better to have a church of 20 impacting a nation than a church of 8,000 not really doing a heck of a lot. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Sorry, verse uh, 8. But you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the world. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and this is the purpose, the evidence is speaking in tongues, but the purpose is power. Sometimes we just limit it to speaking in tongues, but the purpose of the Holy Ghost coming upon you is that you receive power. There is then a clear statement that subsequent to receiving power, you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and so on through the outermost parts of the world. So there is a baptism, as it were, that is for the purpose of power that you're going to do something with it. The church was never called or purposed to be a passive church that just gathers and you know, here's another message. Goodness knows we've all heard about 8,000 messages. I don't know that we need 8,001. Um, but it's, it's purposed and given power to, to have an impact. Now, when you look at that, that Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and so on, what it's really saying is you'll be my witnesses locally, in the city, regionally, and throughout the world. Now, there are some who may never 
be witnesses beyond their immediate environment or church or suburb. That's fine. The, the, you know, you don't have to go to the uttermost parts of the world because not everyone is called to do that. There will be some who may be called to have an impact in their city or their state or their nation or, you know, in another country. That's okay. There are gifts that are given and we know from the, the talents that one was given five, one was given two and one was given one. It was never an issue of, of how many you were given. It was what, what did you do with it? And the only one that really sort of, you know, came a bit unglued and didn't have a happy ending was the one that said, well, you know what, uh, I'm just going to bury this. I'm not going to do anything with it. And in a certain sense, you can make a broad application. He buried it in the earth. The earth speaks of our flesh. So it's a spiritual gift that's just given and buried in the flesh and never, never really allowed to do anything or produce anything. So the, the issue is how active... How, what, what sort of an impact uh, is the church having? The word witnesses comes from a, a Greek word that actually means legal witness. And you can look at it a couple of different ways and both are valid. In some versions of the Bible it says you will be my messengers in Jerusalem, Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. And that's true. We are called to be messengers. But the word witness, when you look at it in a legal sense... A, a witness is normally somebody who is in a court case giving evidence after the fact. So both, both are valid and both are true. But Mark 16, uh, Mark 16, 20 says, and he worked with them, confirming the word that was preached with signs and wonders following. So there's an implication from Pentecost that you are... The Holy Spirit has come upon you. He has endued you with power that you can go forth and not only be a messenger, but that you will preach the word or deliver the word and then you will witness the power of God confirming what you did. But in all cases, there is an implication that you do something beyond keeping a chair warm on Sunday. As much as that might be, as enjoyable as that might be, and lots of fun and friendship and frivolity and fellowship and whatever, it's more than that. If we just look at Pentecost, hey, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You are endured with power that you can be my messengers and also the messengers will witness the power and glory of heaven that is used to confirm what they've been saying. Or we can just come to church and listen to the 8,214th message and say happy days and a cup of tea and go home. And come back and do them. Now, you know, there's all sorts of different giftings and all sorts of different abilities. Whether it's 5, 2, 1, whatever the case may be, but it's, it's about, and, and may I suggest here's a key point, and we're sort of almost at the end of the, the introduction, so, um, so buckle in and do up your seatbelts. So th there was never the issue that the guy with one didn't understand what it was. So we, we cannot use a gift because either A, we make a choice not to, we just bury it. Or we might be in a situation where we say, look, we sense we have a gift, but we don't know how to engage with it or produce with it. And that's particularly the area that I want to go this afternoon in about 15 minutes when we finish the introduction. So, all good. So, th there is a process to... to Take the gifting that you have, whatever that happens to be, and to bring it to life and to give it life. And, and it's a pretty straightforward process, really. And, and I'm sure every single person here has some sort of a dream, vision, hope, expectation, whatever in God. But maybe in the past you've been in a fairly passive church that didn't... Um, you know, go much beyond the happy day Sunday meeting. 
Uh, the lady in red up there is not one of those. <laughs> so I've definitely found that out myself. So this is about activating people. This is about the, the church here is an apostolic prophetic church, and it's about taking people who are born again, spirit filled, power filled Christians, identifying their gift and activating their gift. Pretty straightforward. So let's uh, let's go over to um, Nehemiah. We'll look at a process. Nehemiah is a great historical book. It's also a book that ultimately leads to revival. There is a purpose in the restoration. That ultimate purpose is revival. It can be on a church level. It can be on an individual level. It can be on a global level, whatever the case may be. Now, with the church as a whole, the relationship in the church between the church and Jesus is supposed to be an Elijah-Elisha relationship. In other words, Jesus said, more than, you know, you'll do more than me. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah. So the church-Jesus relationship is an Elijah-Elisha relationship where we are supposed to be doing more of Unfortunately, sometimes there are some churches and some ministries that get sidetracked and instead of becoming an Elisha church, they become a Gehazi church. Gehazi, Elijah's servant. Now, let me tell you what an Eli a Gehazi church is. Gehazi, remember when the Shumanite's son died, Elijah said, take my staff and lay it upon the boy. And nothing happened. The Gehazi church, the staff represented authority. The Gehazi church is a church that kind of, kind of looks all right, sounds okay, uh, exercises a certain degree of religious authority, but is pretty much devoid of power and ultimately becomes self-engrossed. We are supposed to be and Elisha church, doing the much more of, but we can get sidetracked into Gehazi. So with Nehemiah, it's a book of restoration. The restoration, whether you want to take it on the basis of individual uh, restoration, ministry res restoration, church globally, locally, whatever the case may be, happens under the direct ministry of the apostle and the prophet. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 18, it's just a, a small statement on the back end of the verse, it says, and he who blew the trumpet was with me. Is the end of verse, chapter 4 verse 18. Nehemiah in the process represents the apostolic and he who blew the trumpet represents the prophetic. So the restoration in the church and the restoration of ministries takes place under the administration of the apostle and the prophet. There is a process. This book, and I want to show you at the end of it, a kind of a, it's a unique wordplay from Amos, and it's ultimately repeated in, in, in Acts. But it's, it's just an amazing wordplay in Amos, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, in this book of restoration, it starts with this, and there, there is a process. Verse 4, so Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. And it came to pass, as I heard, that, heard those words, because he's had a report back from the, the, about the condition of Jerusalem, where the, the gates had broken down and burnt with fire and so on. So in verse 4, and it came to pass when I heard those words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let me say that not much is going to happen until somebody or somebody's plural take on a genuine burden. Good. 
it starts the restoration of vision, dreams, hopes, goals, whatever. It starts with actually getting serious about it and saying, Lord, I want this to happen. I want life to happen. I want to step into this and release it in substance and life. Now, that might be an individual vision or a hope or a dream or aspiration, or it might be a church cooperately or the church globally. But it starts when we stop messing around and actually take on a serious burden for whatever it is that we're hoping to release life and destiny and purpose into. Then goes on in verse uh, 6. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes be open that you might hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray now before thee day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel that we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. There needs to be not only a burden, but a genuine acknowledgement and recognition of sin and a willingness to engage with God on the basis of covenant, not our own agendas, but engage with him on the basis of covenant and be willing to deal with national sin, family sin and personal sin. So we start with a burden. Then we say, hey, you know what? Maybe what's getting in the way of this revival that we keep crying out for and hoping for and wanting and God bring us revival and maybe what's getting in the way is that somewhere, at least if we've got a burden for it, then we might need to start looking at covenant relationship and dealing with national family and personal sin. Does that make, make a bit of sense so far? It then goes on to the next part. Let, let's drop down, for the sake of time, let, let's drop down to verse 11. Lord, I beseech thee, let me now thine eye, uh, sorry, thine ear be uh, attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy uh, in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So be, there's this unfolding process. There is the burden. There is the covenant relationship. There is the dealing with national, family, and personal sin. And after, and only after those things are dealt with, now it gets into a prayer for favour and grace with those who are going to provide or you know, be engaged with it. Now, that might well be, I mean, get it out of the pages of history into your own life, that might be that a church needs to engage with politicians or engage with people in government or power or authority or whatever the case may be. But before we kind of jump the gun and say, well, let, let's go and engage with these politicians, no, get the burden, deal with covenant relationship, deal with national sin, family sin and personal sin, then pray for favour and grace and then go talk to the king. But you understand there's a process, and through this process, there is provision, there is power, there is authority that is released, and a mandate to do it, but at the end of the mandate, it becomes about national revival, or even global revival. And we keep crying out for this revival, and we, we, you know, we want the multitudes to come to salvation. It can happen. It will happen, yeah. but the church needs to engage with the correct process. Does that kind of make a bit of sense? Yeah. So after the prayer for favour and grace, he then goes before the king. Now, it says he was the king's cupbearer. In those days, you're the king's cupbearer. You turn up with a sad look on your face. You're likely to lose your head. I'm plain and simple. Uh, you know, there was, wasn't a whole lot of flexibility in the equation. You look sad, pal. Gone. Next. I mean, how would you... <laughs> really? <laughs> You're the apprentice cupbearer. <laughs> 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 yeah. You have been on the job for four years as the apprentice cupbearer. 
The main cupbearer just got his head knocked off and they called for the apprentice. You'd be enthusiastic about your job, wouldn't you? Whoa, yeah, I've been just waiting for this opportunity for years. Maybe. <laughs> On the other hand, any jobs for a carpenter anyway? Oh, praise God. So the king said to me, um, why do you look so sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow in your heart. And I was very afraid. He knew. I, depending on what frame of mind the king was in, he might lose his head. Sometimes, sometimes if we are serious about the burden and serious about the fulfilment and the life of the vision, sometimes we have to take risks. Sometimes you kind of just got to put it on the table and say, Lord, you have called me to this mandate. I have prayed this through. I've taken on the burden. I've confessed the sin. I've approached you on a covenant. I've prayed for favour and grace. Now I've just got to step out and, and put a bit of risk behind it. You know, I've got to put some action where the words are. I've got to put a bit of belief and faith where the words are. Otherwise it becomes lip service. And I said to him, uh, we're in verse 5, If it please the king and your servant has found favour in your sight, uh, I ask that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may rebuild it. The king, uh, besides the queen who was sitting, asked me, how long will, it, will your journey take? When will you return? So it pleased him uh, So it pleased him to send me, and I set a time. Whatever your vision is and whatever your mandate or your call is, after the prayer and after the process that we've covered so far, and, and now you've been into the presence of the, the king or the person of authority or whoever you're dealing with, you need to have a clarity. You need to set a time. You need to be clear about what it is you want to do. Uh, um, I, I want to go to India and get a bunch of people saved. Okay, when? Who are you going with? How, how are you going to cost it? What are you looking at? You know, you need, in other words, you need to approach whoever you're approaching. Now, sometimes, maybe on a church or a ministry level, that could be a politician or you know, the local mayor, could, whoever. Sometimes it might simply be um, somebody, a family member or a friend or whatever that we want to share the vision with, uh, whoever God directs us to and so on. So we need to, but we, when we do that, we need to have things like, you know, timing, when's it going to happen, how's it going to happen. We need to be able to go with clarity, not just some vague idea of what we might do someday. So there needs to be clarity. And also said to the king, we're in verse 7, and also said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given to me for the kings, uh, for the governors beyond the Euphrates, that he uh, let me pass through to Judah and to keep a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, to a park, uh, that he may give me timber to make the beams of the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the city and for the house that I will occupy. occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of the Lord was upon me. In verse 9, then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So in other words, after all the prayer, the preparation, the burden, the, the, the confession, the sin, the, the prayer for favour and so on, and the willingness to step out and take a risk, he's now in front of the king. He's presented a clear plan. If you have a vision and you have something you want to fulfil, corporately or individually, do all of that, but you need to seek God or have a clear plan and a clear idea and some time frames, cost, budget, whatever the case may be, while ever it's just some vague thing that you might do one day, it will always be a dream and never a vision. Big difference between a dream and a vision. If it's a vision, you will pursue it and do something about it. If it's a dream, 20 years later, it will still be a dream. Notice when he's presented the king with a clear plan, he's then got cap letters to the governors which speak of authority. He's got letters to the keeper of the forest which speaks of provision. And he, the king has sent cap captains of the army and horsemen which speaks of power. 
So we've now gone through this process from the beginning of the burden to where now it's starting to take shape and take life. We've got authority, we've got provision, we've got power. If you have a vision, if you have a purpose, if you have a calling, then there is time sometimes to sit before God and say, hey, you know what, <laughs> you've given me this mandate, but, you know, I have a requisition for me uh, because I'm going to need stuff if I'm going to fulfil this. Now, God is a good God. He's not going to call you to do something and then not provide for it in the realms of authority, provision and power to fulfil the mandate. Be it corporately, individually, whatever the case may be. But do we understand before we get to that point, there is a process. There is a burden. There is a covenant. There is a confession of sin. There is favour and grace. There's been willingness to take a risk. And now we're in front of the, pers the person who can fund this and provide for this. But sometimes we kind of bypass all of this stuff and say, I've got a great idea. I'm going to do something one day. I wonder if this person will support it. <laughs> Anyway, praise God. So verse 9, then I came to governors beyond the uh, river and gave them the king's letters. It sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Verse 12, so, so now he's there. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one. Let me say this to you. No matter how enthusiastic you are about your dream or your aspiration, not everyone is going to think it's such a great idea and not everyone is going to get on board with you. So he says, I and a few men. If you're going to share your dream and aspiration, your hope and your calling, be selective. Be discerning. Talk to people, a core group of people around you who will, who will support you, who will pray for you, who will bless you. But don't just get the masses involved because chances are 90% of them are going to have something negative to say and they're not going to get on board with you and so on. So I and a few men get a core group around you, whether it's a couple of, fam couple of family members, friend, pastor, brothers and sisters in the Lord, whatever, but get people around you that you are selective and discerning about. I went, uh, then in verse 13, we went out and inspected the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down. And over the page, uh, and he had not told the rulers, he had not told the priests and the nobles and so on. In other words, he's got this core group, this selective group. Then I said unto them, and this is an amazing part here, in verse uh, Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the distress we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we no longer be in reproach. In other words, this thing that has started as a burden, that has then progressed to a covenant relationship, to confession of sin, to a prayer for favour and grace to stand in front of the person who has the ability to fund it and provide for it to a core, core group or a select group of people that you, you trust and discern are with you and behind you to then where you've actually gone and had a look at the situation whatever the vision is, whatever, you, whatever it is that you need, but you've now stated a clear intent and purpose. Mm -hmm. Here's what we need to do. In other words, through this, there needs to be a clarity of your vision, a clarity of your calling, a clarity of your purpose, and when you're presenting it to your core group of people, it needs clarity of vision and purpose. And when that happens, then I said to them, so verse 17, we've looked at that. Verse 18, then I told them of the hand of my God was, was upon me, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Initially, there was not 
It was not necessarily all about God's vision. It was, here's what I need to do. Here's my clear purpose and intent. Because you may find people that are that you are discerning and selective about that God may be going to use to provide or support or uh, you know, embrace the vision, but they may be in a different spiritual spot to you. But here he has, he's explained the clear purpose. Then he said, and by the way, this is what I, the hand of God is on and also the king or whoever the source of provision is, is backing this up as well. Now, when they've said that, when he said that, they've said, let us arise. In other words, in the space of two verses, there has been a transfer of vision, a magnificent transfer of vision where it's, here's what I want to do, here's the situation, here's the purpose, by the way, God is with me on this, and also I've got the provision and the backup. Oh, great, okay, we're on board with you. Sometimes we sort of start trying to get people on board and back the vision and do all sorts of things before we've, yeah, the process. Sometimes it is about the process. How are we doing for time? We're getting a bit late. From there into chapter 3, uh, it's all about bringing the vision to life. So it's all about the building of the walls and the restoring of the gates and so on. Now, we don't have time this afternoon, maybe some other time. Jerusalem is a type of the local church. There are 12 gates that are mentioned which represents apostolic authority. There are six gates that are mentioned as being repaired. Six is the number of fallen man. There are five of the six gates that are specifically mentioned as having the locks and the bars and the beams restored. So we start off with apostolic authority, that which has been damaged and lost through the works of the flesh, but there is a restoration of grace because there are five gates that, are, that have the locks, bars and, and, and beams restored. And five is not only the number of grace, but is also the number of the ascension gift ministry. So what this really is about, I mean, it's a great historical story. And it speaks into the process of restoring the vision and restoring, um, you know, the hopes and the dreams and the aspirations, whether it's an individual or whether it's corporately for a church. But within the church, it's apostolic authority, restoring that which has been lost to the flesh with the grace that is upon the restoration of the fivefold ministry, uh, just literally uh, in those gates. Does that kind of make a bit of sense? Hopefully so. The ultimate purpose of it, the ultimate purpose is ultimately about revival. Would you turn over to um, Nehemiah chapter 8? Get the right scripture there. Okay. This is where there's an interesting kind of a word here. In 2 Samuel, and just for the sake of time, don't worry about turning there, but I'll give you the scripture. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 17, it speaks about the tabernacle that David built. David's tabernacle. Now in chapter 8, sorry, before we do that, just turn over to Amos. The word in Amos, uh, sorry, the word in Samuel uh, referring to tabernacle uh, is a word, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but it's ohel. It, it means tent or dwelling, spelled O-H-E-L. If you turn over to, um, 
Oops. Gotta love technology, particularly when you... So if you turn over to... Um, let me find it. I know I've got one in here somewhere. Turn over to Amos 9.11. Amos 9, Amos 9.11. So speaking about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Normally I'd have a marker on the page and I've missed it. So Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Now, remember before there in Samuel it said, it was talking about the, the tabernacle of David, and it used the word O-L or O-Hel or however it's correctly pronounced, which means tent or, or dwelling. Here's Amos 9.11, in, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up its ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. Now you would kind of think, you would kind of think that if Amos prophesies and says, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, the, the two words for tabernacle, whoop, <laughs> forgot the ice cream. The two words for tabernacle would be one and the same. I mean, it would sort of make sense, you know. The word in Samuel uh, for David's tabernacle is O-L or O-H-E-L, however you'd correctly pronounce it. The word that Amos uses is sucker, S-U-K-K-A-H. And what it actually means, it doesn't mean a tent. It means the rough booths that they would put together out of tree branches. Yes. That struck me as being a little odd. He's talking about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Why would he not use the same word? But if you go back to Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 15, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their towns and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out into the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. The word in Amos is the same word there for booths. So what's it talking about? He's not referring to the tent. He's talking about a rough booth. Why? What, what's the point of all of that? Well... And this is the whole purpose of the restoration of, uh, and restoration of the grace of the ministries and uh, the grace in the church and the whole process of restoration. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive and wild olive. Olive and wild olive represent the Jew and the Gentile. Myrtle represents the restoration and the establishment of the promises of God. Palm represents victory. And leafy branches, it's not talking uh, in your King James or maybe some other ver versions, I think it talks about thick branches. Uh, it's not talking about the thickness or the girth of the trunk or, or the branch. It's talking about the density of the foliage. And the, the density of the foliage speaks of the nations. So it's saying, hey, you know what? It's all about the purpose as we start the purpose. Uh, sorry, the process as we work our way through the process. But we are working to an ultimate purpose. We're out of the Jews and the Gentiles scattered through the nations of the earth there will be a restoration and establishment of the promises of God which will result in victory. That's literally what's tied up in that. And that's why Amos, from my perspective, that's why Amos uses a different word. He brings us back to the booths in Nehemiah. All this 
this burden, this, this prayer, this covenant relationship, this confession of sin, this favour and grace prayer, the willingness to take the risk, the willingness to go before the one that will provide the support, the backing, the, the whatever is needed, the willingness to go out and gather and look and identify and have clear vision and clear understanding to work with a core group of people or the ones or twos or the half a dozen who will support your vision. Then those who will go out and work on the walls and bring it to life. Now, it is an amazing thing. When, when they're working on the walls, there's sons of goldsmiths and apothecaries and merchants. Or, you know, sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zones. You know, just stop and think for a moment. This is a hard, rough, pretty tough, brutal building project. And there are guys there who are merchants, sons of goldsmiths and apothecaries, we might call them chemists or whatever today. You know, they're not exactly hard, calloused hands. Can you stop and think for a moment maybe how many blisters those guys wound up with, how many bruises, how many knuckles skinned and whatever. You know, the apothecary and the goldsmith working on a hard, rough building site. Sometimes to bring life to the vision we need to, when we've prayed and when we've confessed and when we've done everything else, we need to be willing to just plain get out of our comfort zones. It's good. Pretty simple. And the ultimate purpose of all of this is to bring global revival. Yeah. But before the global revival happens, there needs to be a process of restoration in the church and the individual that will bring restoration and understanding back in to the apostolic, the prophetic, and each of those gates not represent, cooperately there's five that represent grace, but each one of them stand for an individual ministry as well that is restored under grace. So turn over to uh, the book of Acts and let's close with this. Acts 15. Acts 15, verse 16 and 17. And after this I will return, and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That, and here's the purpose, I will that. The residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth these things. So there's a process of restoration. And it's an involved process, but we can't, we can't cry out for the revival if we're not willing to engage in the process. You know, it's kind of like saying, I want to be forgiven, but I don't want to repent. Uh, say what now? You're trying to sell me what? No, repentance is the precursor for forgiveness. And the process that we've looked at is the precursor for restoration in the apostolic church or in individual vision whose ultimate purpose is global revival because it's the olive and the wild olive the Jew and the Gentile, the myrtle tree, which is a restoration of the promises of God, the palmer's victory, and the thick branches of the nations of the world. Wow. That's, That's the ultimate purpose of Nehemiah's restoration of the church. Great, great book of history, but it is a powerful prophetic book for this time and place. <laughs>